Hey, can you hear me? Right here, Papa. Is Carla? No, so much. I need you to back up so we can take care of the patient. What's that? <laughs> Nashville, Music City. A lot has changed since the Grand Ole Opry opened its doors 74 years ago. This quaint capital of lonesome songs and old-time religion has become a sprawling metropolis with big city problems. But the paramedics of the Nashville Fire Department have never lost their small town touch. Whether it's broken hearts or broken bones, they dispense their own brand of Southern comfort. I think it's around. Bill Grames is a veteran paramedic with the Nashville Fire Department. I look at it on the avenue that God has given everybody uh, talent. Some people have several, some people only have one or two. This is my particular talent, and I feel that's what he has in store for me to do. Been doing it for 20 years now, and I'm still enjoying the job, and it's something that comes to me easy. Bill is responding to a call from a downtown hotel where a man is complaining of severe chest pains. Oh, yeah. Right there in your chest. Both arms. Both arms. Yeah. Does your pain get any worse when you take a breath in? Okay. Danny Atkinson was in Nashville for a night out on the town. We'll get you out here on the stretcher, partner. Did he eat anything different? Or? Uh, he's ate a, we've ate a steak here at the lobby. Other than that, that's all he's had. Okay. Step up for me, turn right around, and have a seat again. Come on, my friend. Stand up for me. Hmm? Do we have a history of seizures? Do we have a history? Nothing that you know of? Yes. Skin color, with him sweating like he was, the problems that he was having breathing and the pain were all very strong indications that he was having a major heart attack right there. Danny, can you hear me? Danny, get some breaths for me, buddy. Danny. Danny, breathe, uh -huh. brother. Okay. You all know what we was showing there, Henry. Danny Atkinson has stopped breathing. Breathe, Danny! Okay. Ma'am, you need to step outside. Give me a hand boo bag. Breathe, oh. Danny. Ready? Everybody clear? Breathe, breathe, Bubba. Step back. Step back. Breathe, Bubba. Please breathe. Okay. Breathe, Danny. Huh? Breathe, Danny. You're right on the edge because you're wanting so bad, you know, to get something accomplished, and it seems like what you're doing is not working. You have to keep it under control. Danny's heart has stopped. Bill must revive Danny quickly, or he will die. My name is Lee Darnell. I'm a paramedic with the Nashville Fire Department. All right. First off, I want some medium gloves. I took an EMT class. Yeah. And I just fell in love with it. Two salines, five start packs. We need a blanket because it's cold tonight. I fell in love with the language. I fell in love with the action. Four 18s. My extension sets. Oh, let me go ahead and I need a burn sheet. Okay. All right, doing my own thinking. 
being responsible for myself and my partner. It is more fun than Walmart. I like taking care of people. Thanks, Carl. Y'all right, take care. Bye-bye. Coming up here on just east of Valley Parkway in VA. Lee Darnell is dispatched to a motorcycle accident in the downtown area. Medic 11 on school advice. I think all paramedics are adrenaline junkies to a certain degree. I don't care how long you've been doing this. If you get a good call, the adrenaline starts going. I think we all groove on it. Anything on that back? A biker, Dana Matthews, has crashed his motorcycle into a steel pole. I'm doing the talk. I'll go ahead and set up while y'all get it done. Took a pretty hard lick. He's unconscious. He's not breathing well. He's going to need to be tubed. going to be intubated. We're going to need to put an airway in. Get a good look at that back for me when we do. Dana is drifting in and out of consciousness. Lee is worried he may have a brain injury. Ready? One, two, three. Here, we're going to wake up a little bit, are we? Okay, let's hold his neck for me, all right? I'm going to take this off and hold his head, okay? Yeah. Going to wake up too much for it? What was his original condition? Was he ever awake? He never would talk to us. Okay. I'm just going to take this. I'll try it. He was unconscious at the scene. Closed head injury, which means he had some bruising and some damage to his brain. Needed some aggressive airway control. He's going to clamp on me. Do you have suction? Yeah, we got suction. Eddie, would you give me some suction, please? Sir? My primary job at this point in time was to give him good air and keep all the bad stuff out. Can we comply? Yeah. Come on, breathe for him just one more time. Here, don't fight us, sir. Bag him. Where can go? Lee is fighting to maintain Dana's airway. Put it on there for now. No, it's just lodged. Go ahead and pull it back out. Pull it out for me. Dana's combative, a typical sign of a head injury. He's making Lee's job a lot harder. Medical 11, Vanderbilt from Alert. We're going to be en route here in just a minute. We're probably about three or four away from you. So uh, get in line and route for you. Okay. Please, Please, breathe. Bill is trying desperately to get a sign of life from Danny. We got the got pulse on this. Breathe, Danny. He's breathing. Breathe, brother. Breathe for me. He's breathing. Come on, Danny. Breathe for me, brother. Okay, we got a weight pulse for us. Let's go ahead and get him down here. Y'all ready? Bill has brought Danny back. Now he needs to get him to a hospital. The heart, brain, and other organs of the body were without oxygen for a certain amount of time. That's the way. I like seeing them eyes open. It's really hard to get something back after that process starts. Yeah, I know it does. You're going to be okay. We just got a lot of things to do here, Danny, right now. Medic 18 Baptist DR. Paramedic Bill Grames is rushing Danny Atkinson to the hospital. Danny has had a massive heart attack. At 300 at this time, I've shot a sinus attack at 120. Nitroglycerin sublingual times one in route. Uh, we're pulling into your ER at this time. We'll finish reporting when we get inside. We were able to get a blood pressure back on him maybe a minute after he started breathing on his own. But when it's that long of a period of time between the arrest itself and advanced life treatment, usually the outcome of that is not real good. How we doing, man? You hurting? All right, we're ready to fix that. 
is what we hear. Uh, he went out with it. I mean, he was yeah, unconscious. He was, he was yeah. unconscious and pulsed the shit. So, we like, could, cardio vertigo, got him back out. He was shocked him at 200 and then went to 300 and converted to 300. It's a team effort all the way around. And uh, when it works well, it's like a machine. Blood pressure was 160 over 100 coming in. Hey, good job. Thank you very much. All right, can I get one right above yeah, He converted it out real good. You know what I mean? uh, Danny's his first Danny one. Danny Red. Thank you, sir. Can you hit that start button on that blood pressure cuff over there for me, Dr. Davidson? Hi, I'm Dr. Davidson. Can you hear me? This was a really good call as far as doing a conversion and everything. He went into what's called a coarse V-fib, and we defibrillated him at 200 and also at 300. He converted into a sinus tack with a pulse without it. It's pretty excellent results on that. That's a quick, good sign of what quick early defibrillation can do. Converted him right into a viable rhythm from a rhythm that was going to kill him. I said, man, when it turns out good, it's a, it's a good feeling. It's one that makes you, it makes you feel good that you've been able to help, been able to make a change in what happened. So that's the way to leave the shift right there. supply, but his head injury has made him combative and difficult to treat. You got time to listen to his lung sounds see if he's still saying somewhat clear? Yeah. He was not breathing well. He was not maintaining his airway. He was vomiting. There you go. Oh, no, no, no. Put your leg down. Put your leg down. He was flailing around. Could not get an IV in him for anything. It's not running. Uh, we're out on this one. I'll bag for you to go ahead and get the Robert Shaw out. I was not working with my regular partner, I was working with somebody else. Just nothing could go right. It was a very frustrating call. Yes, sir. Sir, we're trying to help you. Hey! Let us help you. Bye. Let us help Maybe he would not have had quite suffer quite so much if things had just gone a little bit better. Don't fight us, okay? There's no stand yet. Okay, now you gotta step. You got out. Alright, let's get on in there. MBA, motorcycle versus pole, unconscious on a scene, snoring respiration. Tried to innovate him, it woke him up enough. We had to bag him to keep him going. His pelvis looks stable. He definitely needs to be too. We were not able to do it. Real frustrating. Oh, Not to mention he vomited in my eye. My husband says he can tell from the moment I walk in the door when it's been a bad day or a bad call. And I would wind up beating myself up over it for a very long time. This particular guy was drinking really cheap beer, I can tell you. To a certain extent over the years, I've developed a hardness. I don't let a lot of what I see bother me on a real deep level. You know, we make the big joke, you're not a paramedic unless you've absolutely torn up the bag. Does that make me a paramedic tonight, Mr. Carter? <laughs> I'd have preferred it a whole lot more if we'd gotten stuff done while we were back here. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> to watch everything to find out how to use it. Okay, my name is uh, Tom Gilmer. I'm a paramedic with the Fire Department in Nashville, Tennessee. I've been a paramedic uh, for the Fire Department for uh, going on 17 years. Look here. Don't tell me who used that last. I don't think I've got a compulsive disorder. I don't. 
live and work in the neighborhood that I grew up in. To me, it's easy to work on somebody that you know and maybe comfort them in their hour of need. I've done my work for the night. There's a hush in the crowd as the Shadmaster comes in right. for the final. Mm -hmm. My name's Tom Shadwick. I've been a paramedic for about 15 years. I've been with the fire department in Nashville for going on 11 years. Tom Gilmer and Tommy Shadwick are longtime partners. Fire! Damn! Working in EMS for at least 12 hours in some cities, 24 hours at a time, you're working with an individual, and you either click or you don't. I think him as a brother. I love my brothers. I love my partner. Well, considering this game is fixed anyway, it's his game. He will always win. He always win. Tom Gilmer and Tommy Shadwick are being dispatched to a suspected heart attack. They turn back toward Donaldson. In the middle of the night, a woman tells 911 her husband is having a heart attack. When the paramedics arrive, Chris Lumley doesn't want to go to the hospital. We got there, we found an elderly gentleman that uh, he had gone to the bathroom and collapsed. The wife said that uh, he said he felt much better and didn't need us anymore. The number one uh, sign and symptom of a heart attack is denial. Your chest is hurting now? I just ache a bit very lightly in here. We get 12 right now. My arm feels a little wacko. Look at your face. How's that feel? Pretty well right down here through the jaw. Generally not too hot. You want 12 too? Yeah. You can deny a lot of things, but one thing you cannot deny is fear. And to me, when you see a person having an actual heart attack, you can see the fear in their eyes. Take a deep breath for me. They think they're going to die. OK, relax. We're going to be doing some things to you kind of fast, OK? He was having chest pain. He was a little bit sweaty. He was pale. So he was sick. He was definitely having a heart attack. Are you sweaty, or is this where you had a wet cloth on you or something? I had a wet cloth. OK. I'm on a heart monitor. He ran a 12-lead EKG also, started an IV. Then we gave him some nitroglycerin for the chest pain, some aspirin and then uh, transport him to the hospital. We'll be leaving here in just a minute. No, I'll be when you get along with your partner, you mesh together, you get the job done. You may have a different theory on how it should proceed, but the outcome is going to be the same. And so I can rely on Tom when things happen. He's thinking the same thing I am. Have you ever felt like this before? No. no. Okay. I work best when the situation is very unstable. I feel like the more serious it is, the more serious I am, the more in control that I am. Transporting birds in traffic, have a 63-year-old male woke up with a substernal chest pain rating in the left arm. It's giving you a little bit of fluid to help your heart blood pressure get up a little bit. I'm doing fine. How you doing? Right. Now you promised me some hot ones if I came today, right? Yeah, hot. <laughs> Your buddy there made me promise to come see him. This is a this is a late night Southern tradition. Now, if you can stomach anything at 3:30, you can stomach a crystal. Mm-hmm. Please. Now they 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 they're fresh, right? They good? Wonderful. See, I don't. I don't do a whole lot of red meat. But there ain't no hardly no red meat on this, just like cow lips and tails. <laughs> I like them when they're hot now. When they're set up, you can play hockey with them. Lee Darnell gets called to a street fight on the south side of town. Medical over, Medcom. You can put us on scene. Did you call PD? They were on the phone with us. 
Alright, Sheriff, we've got a fairly large crowd out here. We don't have any kind of medium, so. Evening, gentlemen. Okay. Gwen Harris was right. badly beaten in a fight. Each one, one, one more of you over here. Let's go ahead and try to roll this good unit, okay? All right. And the only thing got the one that is We had a very large number of, of very upset family members there and very upset neighbors. Should have been just a routine medical call. Had a real shot, shot of becoming a whole lot uglier just because we had a lot of people upset. Yeah, we're going to take good care of them. The stresses do get to me. I'd be fooling myself if I'd say they weren't. There's a lot of physical stress involved. There's a whole lot of emotional stress. Quinn? Quinn? Quinn, you need to open up your eyes for me now. I see a lot of ugly things. I see a lot of people in real bad situations, real bad life situations, day to day, and it's very hard. What happened to you? You need to tell me so I can tell the doctors. What's that? Okay, how, did they, how'd they beat you up? Did they beat you with a stick or something? Or they hit you with your fist? Do you remember? Uh, I'm sick. Mm -hmm. My hurts. Your stomach hurts. Okay, I'm gonna put this oxygen back on you. Okay. That ought to help you with your stomach hurting. Okay? <laughs> Real, huh? you look, yeah. How much have you had to You didn't ask me that then. Hmm? I heard, I heard the first time. Okay, you didn't answer me. How much well, have you had to drink? Well, you asked me, you said ask though. I said ask you how much have you yeah, had to drink tonight. Yeah, you didn't ask me though, Hold baby. Hold on, please put your arm down. Okay, please put your arm okay, down. Okay, okay, okay. Um, this happens a whole lot with drinking. Oh. <laughs> lose all sense of propriety. They get to fight with each other. I understand. I understand. You know, there, there's a lot of mental anguish involved when you have someone that you can't fix. Oh, put your hand down there. Put your hand down. And there's a lot of times that I can do everything I can, I just can't make them any better. This is Quinn Harris. He's 33 years old. Was at a local uh, pub establishment, got to a fight. I understand that he was hit with a rock and then thrown on, to the ground on his head. No loss of consciousness according to the bystanders. When we got there, he was awake. He was refusing to respond. He did have good blink, eye blink reflex and became fully awake, alert, and oriented with some ammonia. I can't find anything other than the lap to his forehead. There's no depression, no crepitus to that except his file signs were fine. Uh, his mother's been notified and she's supposed to be on her way up here. That takes care of that. Chris Lumley doesn't think he's having a heart attack. All his vital signs tell the paramedics otherwise. 63 year old male, no heart history, problems with disease. He woke up this morning with the chest pain, left arm pain. And I couldn't get a blood pressure at all. Several of us tried and we couldn't get one. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst pain you've ever felt, yeah. 0 being no pain at all, what would you call your pain right now? Oh, probably about the 1. He was describing some chest pain. It was kind of there, kind of not there. He was being very vague with the symptoms. For various reasons, people deny. They think they're not uh, old enough to have a heart attack. They're too good in physical shape to have a heart attack. It would never happen to me. My parents haven't ever had a heart attack. For whatever reason, you try to uh, skip the word heart attack. You don't want to think you're having one. They just didn't feel good. Have you had angina in the pants? Not true. When I talk to his wife, because I know in the emergency room, you sit out there for hours and never hear any information. So I like to go out and tell the people just what's going on, and uh, I don't lie to them, I don't sugarcoat it, I tell them exactly what, what's going on and uh, what to expect. Anytime you have a heart attack, the, the first 
24 hours is really the most important part. Okay. Because you can have a lot of things, different things happening to your heart during that time. Okay. But, uh, but he got here pretty quick. Right, yeah. And he, at the rate he was going, he wouldn't have made it through the night. Is that right? Because he had no blood pressure mm -hmm. and no pulse. I mean, his pulse was real low. Okay. You know? so, you did the right thing. Well, I feel like... <laughs> And he's awake and he's talking. Yeah, he was talking all the time. And, uh, they'll, they'll let you come back there when they get they're running EKGs and X-rays and so forth okay. on him. They'll let you come back and see him when they get all that done. Okay. 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 I just wanted to let you know he's doing okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll pray for you. All right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Right. Yeah. I the acute anterior MI. So. So he's sick, sick man. Yeah, he's having a big one. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi, I'm Dr. Lynch. Hello. Hello. You're with this young fellow? Yeah, Chris. Life can change so fast. Yeah. In just a matter of a second, you can be talking to someone, and then yeah. one second later, you're dead. Yeah, well, he... Okay, it's not very often that you can uh, actually say that you've made a difference in somebody's life, but in those few uh, life-threatening situations, such as a heart attack, you know you can make a difference. You know if they didn't call an ambulance, he would, he would be dead now. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind about that. Good luck to you. Thank you. Okay. Good luck to you, sir. It's morning in Nashville. The start of another shift. Bill has a surprise visitor when he arrives at the fire hall. Is this the guy? It's him. That's the man. You look familiar to me. You look a lot better standing up than laying down on that bed. I guarantee you. There's your fruit basket. Well, thanks, everybody. When I walked into the fire hall and seeing Danny standing there and everything, that, that's just one of the best feelings that you can have. I mean, you know, see your patient come back and, and know that everything's doing well with him. This is what I do the job for. Uh, I thank y'all. You don't know how much I'm... Uh, thank you. Thank you. Man, that's good. I quit smoking. There you go. That's my next step. I'll watch what I do now. There you go. <laughs> hey, you got a nice family, man. You yep. look good. They're, they're okay. All this has been given back to him, so now it's up to him and it's up to them. Take advantage of what they've got and live it to the fullest. Thank y'all for it. Good God. Thank you, buddy. You're more than welcome. Appreciate it. Like I said, man, it was it. Anything I can do for you, you got my number. You go. Call for that. Same here. If you need us, call us back. Hopefully, you won't ever need us again. There you go. I need to have my call. I didn't want to call and say hi to you. That's it. Do that. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Stop being sick. I will. Thank you. Bye bye. We're ready to go play again. <laughs> you riding with us tonight? Good deal. It's a sunny Saturday afternoon in Nashville, and paramedic Bill Graves has gotten a call to a sporting accident. Hey, take that con, go ahead, Joe. That sounded good to you. Sorry about that. Are you a reporter for me or mine? Justin Russell stepped in a hole, twisted his leg, and now it's stinging and burning. Okay. Hey, Justin, I need to check your leg here real quick, okay? I'm going to try not to hurt you, buddy, all right? We're not going to move it a whole lot. It hurts right under the knee. Underneath your knee. And right now, it hurts right there and it stings and everything. Can you wiggle your toes for me? You didn't get out to the reporter because that kid doesn't want you to wiggle your toes for me. <laughs> if 
the person is scared. They're looking for somebody to come in and say, everything's going to be okay, we're going to handle this situation. Okay, well, this will keep your leg from moving, okay? We assure the patient, we assure the family members, and I really feel that that's a lot of our job. Will you try this for me? Mm -hmm. we've, okay. we've tried it three or four times, but they won't move. Okay. I just barely moved in and a half of a centimeter, and it's done like crap. Okay. Can you feel me touching your foot? Does it hurt in your ankle, or is it up in your knee that it hurts? It hurts, it hurts the worst right up under the ankle. Right, I mean, right up under the knee. It's the second worst right up under the ankle. Under your ankle, okay. Yes. All right, buddy. What's your last name, Justin? Russell. Justin Russell. That's a good sounding name. Well, let me get my clipboard, and I'll be right back. Okay? All right. How do you spell your first name? J. J. Okay. U. S. Three. I need to get you Bremis Mays. How many dozen you want? I don't know. What are they? How much were they? You tell me. What? A whole big dollar a dozen. Well, that's good. That's all the press. Let me, uh, let me see if my, my dad and him want something too. Okay. Because then I may get like a box from you, like you brought that one day. I'll pick them up for you next time. Just let me know how many you want. I will. I'll take well, now they're off. really going to be convinced that we're city people. We're talking about selling eggs. <laughs> really? It's bad enough people think we sit around they here were and with uh, blue jeans and bare feet and straw on our mouth and big hillbilly hats. They just look. That just doesn't happen here. Not very often, anyway. One reason I do pretty well at, at de-stressing, I think, is because I live out in the country. Much slower paced out there. Now, get back in there where you're supposed to be. No, ma'am. I have a really good family life. Give me a scoop of sweet tea. I have a husband of, of 10 years who takes me away from it all. I have two little girls I stay very busy with. Can I look it up? I don't know. All right. We have a, a little farm where we raise horses and chickens and cows and just have a good time. This is where the chickens stay during the daytime. We have one broody hen. I have all my chickens lay brown eggs. Do you want to get the other eggs for me out of that hole there? I will. Well, you can haul the chickens down for me if they'll come. I get out there and I work with the animals and they're quiet. And I'm quiet. I don't turn on the radio. It gets me away from the city. I need to get away from the city. third base ended Little Leaguer Justin Russell's dramatic dash towards home plate. Paramedic Bill Grames doesn't think his injury is life-threatening. Justin was rounding third and heading for home. 
stepped in a hole. There we go, my man. Getting home. It's about that deep. Tried to get him wiggle his toes and everything. He said it hurts too bad when he tries to do that, but he can feel me touching him. Capillary refills about two seconds on that. Okay. Can you wiggle this stuff? Bring it straight up? I tried up. six times. I wouldn't do it because I hurt too much. Can you push down just with the toe, not the foot? Oh, God, that hurts. Please stop. I'm not doing anything. I'm asking you to push down against my finger. Oh, there you go. Good. Okay. Hurts. We'll see you after a while, buddy. Take care. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, I believe he'll make it. <laughs> yeah. He was, he was a hoot. I like those kind of patients, they're fun. My goal and my purpose for going through the day is to get as much out of it as I possibly can. And if in the process of doing that, I can help somebody else along the way, then I'm going to do that. He has to be nice to me because he spends more time with me than he does his wife. We harangue each other, we aggravate each other. I pick on him, and he aggravates me, and, and it makes the day go by. Uh, White Castle? No, okay. we're not doing White Castle either. Those are just little square nasty burgers. Okay. Well, I'm not arguing with you. Okay. Lee and her partner Ned have been called to a SWAT team raid on a crack house. This is SWAT call. Back left, that's for The fact that we were making a crack house wasn't unusual. What was unusual was the fact that we were making it with the SWAT team. Hey, Chris, what time are you going to use on the search warrant? Lee and her partner are responding to a report of an injury during a SWAT team raid on a crack house. Where are we going to? I'm trying to. Yeah. So the distraction device went off. She jumped down. You got The SWAT was doing a vice bust. They were doing it on the crack house, and they threw a concussion grenade in there. She's got flash burns. She's uh, got through the skin, with her arm, and her forearm in here. Are you allergic to anything, Wendy? No, sir. Okay. Ma'am, what's your last name? I'm one of the paramedics, no, okay? One young lady hit the floor and was struck by the force of the concussion grenade. More than likely, what I'm going to tell you about that happened. Thing when it hit and it blew, it blew that grenade. That's just when it was yeah, concussion grenades. Is that yeah, yeah. I'm going to pull this out, money just for time. Being. Okay. Is there any way exposure at all? No. Okay. It's been instantaneous. Angel, give me my phone, please. You got hepatitis or HIV or anything, Wendy? No, sir. You been smoking any crack today before we got here tonight? These IV drugs and all. You're going to be all right. I felt badly for her. She obviously was hurting really badly, and burns are, are a terrible, terrible injury to receive. She did look like she'd been through a bombing. Why don't you take this right hand, why don't you squeeze Breathe. an orange with your hand. Do this for me, several times. There you go, in and out, there Good you job. go, good job. Ma'am, if you start, do you have a headache right now? Yeah. Does your whole head hurt all over? Just on that left side? I understand. <laughs> Well, messed up real bad. No, it's not messed up. I'm just messing with arms.
It was early in the morning, still dark outside, and we've been to this address before. Okay, let's go see what we can find. A woman that lives by herself. She lives on, on like a farm, and um, she wears a device around her neck that uh, if she gets disoriented, falls down, whatever, she can press it, and it sends a message to a box that calls an alarm company, and they in turn call the fire department, and we go out and see what's wrong with her. Gilmer and Shadwick can't treat the patient unless they can get into the house. I don't want to get shot. I know it. How do you open that? Hey, just try to call the resident. We're going to have to break a door to get an exit. Why not? Uh, you're breaking up. I can't understand what you're saying. I, don't, I hate for it to be a false call. We're breaking her up because she ends up shooting us over it, you know? But how do you get this open anyway? It's got to be a... Okay. Okay. Grandma might be having a shotgun or something. I hear someone wanted the dispatcher to know. Hi, Barbara. And Miss Cutler. Miss Cutler. For someone like Miss Britton, who received third-degree burns, which are the worst kind of burns that you can receive, it's a it's a nasty, nasty kind of trauma. She was involved in the middle of a SWAT call. She, uh, we understand it from the SWAT paramedic, initially dived down where the concussion grenade was when it went off. She has a puncture wound to the left side of the skull. Yeah. Those concussions. Yeah. Burns are very painful. The treatment's even more painful. It's a pretty horrible thing to go through. Those kind of patients get to me a lot. Medical 11, man, come. Medical 11. Man, we complete our assignment to Vanderbilt. We need to get down to the center and get some O2 on. Um, at the same time, I can't come home and, and fret over it. I need to get ready for the next call. Ms. Cutler? Ms. Cutler? Right here. What's the matter, sweetie? What, what are you doing on the floor? Next time I made 28, we have access. Well, I'm telling you, they have changed my medication. Yeah? And I have the strangest dreams. And I dreamed I was out walking with somebody. And I got up. And when I did, I couldn't grab anything. I was right there by the bed. But I had this around my neck, so I thought I'd better call you. Are you hurt anywhere? I'm not hurt anywhere, except I can't get up. You just need help getting up, sweetie? Yeah, that's all. Okay. Just hand me a hand. You sure you're not hurt? No. Okay. I guess I think I'm about to say it here. Okay. Now, you live here all by yourself, don't you? Yes, I do. My son comes. My, my daughter, you know, lives up on the hill. That yeah, I she's that. in Spain right now. What's she doing in Spain? She's taking flamenco lessons and using her castanets and taking Spanish lessons. And she'll be gone till the 23rd of this month. Well, mercy. So she's out of town. So you have uh, you have your son checking on you every day? Yes, my son checks on, but he's going out of town next next month in May. Uh huh. So he'll be gone. My blood pressure's been high. So you think you just had a bad dream? I had a bad dream. And that you were up and walking around. But you see what happened was, I had a bad dream and I turned on my flashlight there by the bed. Uh huh. And when I did, I fell out of bed. Well, it's a good thing you had that, isn't it? Well, it's just wonderful. I wouldn't take anything for it. It mm -hmm. saved my life before. It did tonight. It did again tonight. That's great. Brush your alarm clock. Your light hand light was still on. I know it. That's the only light I had. Where do you want me to put it? Right there. Okay, I'm going to put it right here next to the, uh, yeah. next to the uh, alarm clock, okay? Yeah. Can I get you some more cover? Oh, I'll, I'll have plenty. Are you sure that's plenty? Well... Why don't I get you some more? Because you won't be able to get up and get it yourself. Well, let's see. Where's it at? Where can I get you something? Well, I'm sitting on it. Well, you need to go ahead and sit on that because this, this leather is going to be cold on your bottom, too. Yeah. I've got everything. 
you all are so nice. I appreciate it. Well, I don't want you to get cold in the middle of the night. Well, I'll be okay. Is this phone where you can reach it? Uh -huh. You want it over here? No, right there. I can reach right here again. Okay. Are you going to leave the light on there? Can you turn it off yourself? Or? I can turn it off right here. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, you have a good night, okay? Well, you too. Be careful. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks a million. You're welcome. I don't want to be done without you. Okay. All right. You're done. That's a front. In EMS, you have short-term contact with the patient, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes at the most. And then after that, they go on their, their way, and so do you, and they're gone. Okay. When big city criminals outman and outgun the cops, there's only one last line of defense. Now hit the streets with America's top SWAT team, next on TLC. And to hit a website that's tops on the internet, go to TLC.com. Tennessee. These roads have transformed a town of country western bands and farmhands into a booming business hub. But for those left behind, alcoholism, drug use, and disorientation mean a world out of balance. The paramedics of the Nashville Fire Department are the only safety net for many of the lost souls wandering the lonesome highways of Music City. Hey. Have a nice one. See you in a little bit. Good job. <laughs> Alex. <laughs> My name is Henry Booker. I've been in this business uh, 28 years. Mr. Young, look at it. Young Dr. Young. Back before there was any such thing as EMT, uh, EMS service. And back then, the funeral parlors ran ambulance service. This guy right here, you rock with Metro's finest. Yeah. In his face, I see courage, intimidation, professionalism. Even a little bit of alcoholism. How's it going back? Yeah. Always say so. When they told us we had to go to be certified to become emergency medical technicians, we laughed. It's like I got a meeting with them in the morning. And y'all get there before I do, say a good word for me. Uh oh, gotta find my partner. You haven't seen Barry, have you? Here we go. Let me go ahead. Henry Booker gets his first call of the night. Engine 5, rescue 2, medical 11. Are we going east, west, north, or south? Only dispatch knows. 1764, 1764, North Galton Road. Henry is dispatched to the west side of town, where a young boy is sick. Sit in the Neville Rest. It's best to eat your cornflakes and get a good night, good day's rest, because when you come in here to work night, Body and mind belong to the city. I've been doing this so long, it's just about second nature. I try to give them their money's worth, so. It's part of me. It's a big part of my life. And I just love helping people. I guess I've, I was just like everyone else when they first started into this business. I think you're going to save the world. But that's not necessarily the case. You see some gloves back there, extra large or close to it? We responded to a call of a nine-year-old that was uh, late at night. He was asleep in bed. I could hear him breathing in the hallway before I even got to the doorway of his room. Okay, what happened to the little guy? 
Nine-year-old Mario Frazier was just released from the hospital after serious hip surgery. Hi, bud. You got uh, uh, a stethoscope. Sound like he's got some swallows on his. I, yeah, I tell you what, I'm, just, I'm not gonna waste no time. I'm just gonna get him out to the beginning. What hospital? Yeah, this little guy's in bad shape. Mario is coughing up a lot of blood. There's no time for Henry to treat him at the scene. Are you the mother? Uh-huh. You need to ride with us, man. Going. Sound like he's got some of this in his lungs. Get the suction from me. Hey, Barry. We're about to lose this little boy. You got to think about EMS is, uh, it's kind of like bringing the hospital to the patient. My name is Kevin Kennedy. I'm a paramedic with the Nashville Fire Department. Been a paramedic for 18 years. Medic 28, Ralph. Oh, I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, grew up in the South Side and uh, come down here in 1982. We're going to the Riley Parkway, uh, southbound. We got a report of a motor vehicle accident. Obviously, when somebody dials 911 for an emergency, something has gone wrong in their life. And you're called to come and try to help sort it out. You're going to see some horrific things. You're going to see some things that would make other people go into shock. How many you got? Two patients. The girl is laying down. This car, apparently the white car, was parked on the bridge. And they came in and ran it. She also has epilepsy also. Everywhere. I'm going to find my pager. You hear me? Can you hear me? Jennifer Harden was in the passenger seat when her girlfriend's car plowed into a vehicle abandoned on the interstate. Ow! We got up there on the scene. It was kind of like in daytime. It's chaos. Everybody running around. With Vanderbilt on climb alert, we got one head injury here. Don't move, hon. Yeah, let me have some oxygen on this throw here. Please help me. I am, sweetheart. I'm him. Just stay still. No. One of the things that we try to do is control the scene. Uh, control the scene so we can get the most good done at the time. What was she at in the car? Most lives and emergencies are saved on the scene rather than in the hospital. Let's get the board on here. All right, you got control of C-spine, right? All right, one, two, three. I think one has to stand up and show Let's go. that I'm here to help you. I'm going to do the best I can. And you make them feel as if you're going to do everything there is possible to be done, and we do. What'd you say your name was again? I'm gonna need that, sir. Get that medicine from that officer here. She had some severe facial injuries. Any force like that that's significant to cause that much facial injuries, you also pretty well can assume that there might be some chest trauma. Hook her up to the oxygen saturation, see what her face is. Also, any type of trauma to the face, you're concerned of possible head injuries. All right, we got a sinus rhythm, we got good radio pulses, we got good respirations. Can we give me a four by four, please? Yeah. Uh. Okay, I got a laceration above the right eye, a laceration to the nose. Can you hear me? Uh, okay, good. What's today? Do you know? Uh, uh, you don't know what today is? Uh, okay. Kevin is worried that Jennifer's confusion is a sign she may have a brain injury. Can you hear me? Okay. You're gonna be okay, all right? Okay. All right, we're ready to go. This is up to dog. Come on, we go. Henry knows from the dark color of Mario's vomit that he is bleeding internally. If it can't be stopped, Mario could die. You need to be suction. See if you can give me some history for her, and she can stand back here. Pediatric mask opening right up there. Emergency traffic man. Possibility that some of this blood might have got into his lungs. Hey, partner. You gonna be okay? Our biggest problem with this young boy was trying to get him keep his airway open and give him oxygen. Can you hear me? What's your name? Can you tell me your name? Can you tell me your name? His stomach was distended slightly and rigid, letting me know there was a lot more blood down in the stomach. All we could do was suction it as it come up and keep suction on him and oxygen. And I feel like my hands are tired. Number one, he's pediatric size. Number two, I'm not gonna waste a lot of time trying to get IV when I can't even see a blood vessel. Uh, basically, about the only thing I can do is hurry up and get him there. Hi, Charlie. 
When you go in an emergency situation, these people are putting themselves in your hands. I ain't gonna feel a bump. So I have to emit a confidence when I go into a call. You're all right. But what we try to convey to the patient is, yes, I do know what I'm doing. Easy, easy. And easy. we're gonna give you the best care possible, and this is what we try to project. Point tenderness in the neck. Right now, she's got stable vital. One, two, three. And I'm gonna need to secure this neck. Pelvis is stable. Do we have a shot? Working. Okay. Oh. So we have me. So she's um, awake and alert. She has no allergies. Oh. 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 Uh, anything to the high bridge of the nose, we're concerned about skull fracture. The way she kept repeating her questions was telling me that she probably has a concussion. I think she'll do okay. I hope she will. Woo! Yeah. Aramedic Henry Booker rushes nine-year-old Mario Frazier to the ER. Mario's blood pressure is plummeting, and he's nearly comatose. I've been suctioning all the way. Okay. Okay. This is a nine-year-old male that was just uh, uh, dismissed yesterday, had uh, hip surgery. We've been suctioning him for a while. Uh, this is what he's been spitting up. I have a weakness for children, and when they in dire need, it's altogether different from treating them than it is adults. They can drop so fast, level of consciousness. Got about 300 cc's out of them already. And he has a radial pulse. He's cold and tachypnic. He has bilateral crackles. Are there any allergies or meds I need to know about? His meds are right there. Try to get a BP on him. I couldn't get here or nothing. Let's get a normal chest, please. You know you sat. We're getting IVs. The trauma team works quickly to stabilize Mario and prepare him for exploratory surgery. And read me off the labs that you sent, please. Uh, CC, basic metabolic. Uh, this is one. Uh, my little boy. I don't know. I would assume so. Been through so much. Actually, I think he was crazy. Yeah, he was standing there. He just weighed one pound, one and a half ounces on his boy. And he has a usual pattern that he has a... He just left. Um, yesterday? Just yeah. left here yesterday? Mm-hmm. You've been doing fine until this happened, huh? Yeah, been doing just fine. It wasn't long after we got him to the hospital that they took him up for exploratory surgery. He had a little GI bleed. What caused it, I don't know. And that's one of the things in this business. You really can't follow up with a lot of the patients you take in, and it keeps you wondering. People think that because you're a paramedic, you're a little bit above human. Got a signature, and I'll be ready to go, Lieutenant. But we have feelings also, and you have to learn to deal with those feelings. I find peace and quiet, and dealing with it uh, in church, dealing with in church, talking to the Lord about it.
Heather. How are you doing? I need uh, a little more combo. Cheese. Yeah. Uh, no onions or pickles. My name is Martin Mitchell. I've been a paramedic for 10 years now. This is the best job I've ever had. This is like uh, the biggest hamburgers in town. I have to get a little more. I eat a lot. The big mo is huge. And they're wonderful. I've always said I'm a trauma junkie. I live for excitement. To me, blood is like grease you get on your work. It doesn't even affect me. That's the small. Now I'm gonna go eat it. Every time Mark gets hungry, I have to drive. He don't ever get hungry when he's driving. He's hungry when I'm driving. My name is Vic Reeves. I've been with the Nashville Fire Department for five and a half years now. And let me tell you, that boy, that boy can eat now. About 12 times a day. Paramedics Mark Mitchell and Vic Reeves have been partners for five years, but they've been best friends since high school. We can't hear you, Mark. What'd you say? We more or less grew up together. Yeah, he's part of the family. We abuse each other constantly. I don't know what he's saying. Mark and Vic are dispatched to a highway underpass where a pedestrian was struck by a car. Amy Bobbitt, a homeless girl, wandered across the road and was hit. She's unconscious. Where's the driver? Lady said she hit the car with her head and then went over the top of the car. Okay. She had the lights all over the right side of her body, but the uh, majority of the injury, I believe, is her head injury. I think that's some her main problem right now. She wasn't doing a lot of bleeding. It was mostly just, I think it was the trauma from being hit like she was. started working on her, she became a little more responsive. Actually, she became combative. This is just Austin, you know, he's not gonna hurt you. Uh, uh, Wait, put your leg down. What's that fight? Uh, okay, give me a line, bitch. Uh, Amy's combative. Mark's worried she may have a head injury. She needs a doctor fast. said that she was a crack cocaine user and combativeness could have been from the effects of the drugs that she was taking, so you never know with that much. Yes, sir, not your location. Marcy Travis got a 19-year-old female. Uh, was struck by a motor vehicle approximately 35 miles an hour. She did hit the windshield, face it with her shoulder and head. She is extremely combative this time. We have established two IVs. Running line running saving, running KVO. Uh, one good light to the side of her head, one good light is to her uh, left side of her neck. Left side of her head, hit the windshield, the windshield was torn on the vehicle. She's got two IVs, one LR, one saline, both 18 gauge. Been running basic KV all the whole way. Open your eyes. This kind of work, you see people in the worst situations and try to make those situations better. I don't know if it makes me strange or what it is, but I really enjoy doing it. Can somebody call and see if CT scan is ready for her? For sure. And we're ready for our x-rays. Also, they said she's got history of crack cocaine use. I don't know what she's been doing today, but she's got history of it. Abnormality. Oh, no! 
Amy has a serious concussion and will be hospitalized for a few days. Young. Yeah. Wow. I think there's a lot of people that come here trying to, trying to make it big and then they get out here and find out that all the glitter is in gold and they end up being homeless. Don't don't have the money to get back home, so they're forced to live on the street. They come here with big hopes in mind they're gonna be a country music star and it just fades away. They don't get it. Actually, the first day's wash day, and it was clean, but we ran through a lot of uh, water, rain, whatever, on the first day, so it's got to be clean again. So, can't stand riding right dirty the unit. My name's Edie Walker. I've been with the department for about 12 to 13 years. It's something I've always wanted to do. I had four years of college before I even started the department. Got a degree in education, but it's not what I wanted to do. This is. We're ready. I love my job. There's no doubt about that, or I wouldn't still be here. Edie is called to a domestic dispute. I started this job basically because I enjoy helping people. There are days that people want to fight us. There are days that uh, people want to cuss us. But it's those days that you make a difference is uh, what really makes you feel good and, and makes you really like this job. This is Larry Griggs. Uh, he was taken to the hospital Saturday evening. Okay. Larry Griggs walked out of the hospital with an IV still in his arm. Yeah, it's still there. The there, left. there. Yeah. Okay. He's okay. pulling out. That's it. Well, how old are you, sir? Forty-three. Forty-three. What relation are you, man? Uh, he, he's living with me. He's living with you. Yeah, but I want him out of here. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't okay. have any say so over that, yeah. and I can't take it out. Larry, if you got to go and get that out, man. Well, I done told him no. Man, what was he seen? What was he seen at the hospital for? Um, he had blood cut on his lung. In the past. In the past. Uh, in the past. Uh, ba in the bacteria past. in the blood. Bacteria in the lungs. He's got a bad heart. Uh, bacteria in the urine. Bacteria in the blood. Um, all this bunch of stuff. And uh, uh, he almost uh, killed himself by drinking. That gentleman was was really. He was a very sick man, and he needed to go back to the hospital. Are you supposed to follow up with your doctor later? Why did you want to be like okay. this? Some people need to go to the hospital and won't. He, he definitely needed help. And sometimes trying to talk these people into going back to the hospital is like trying to pull teeth. Why don't you let us take you to the hospital, honey? It won't take but a little while. Let them take your calf out. Make sure it's okay and it's not infected. And if you need medication, make sure that you get the medication you need. This is Okay, good thing. He was tired of the situation. He, you see it all the time. Uh, tired of his home life. Oh, yeah. Have a seat right there on that blue bench, Larry. That gentleman definitely needed to go, and, then, and I was I was glad that he did go. Find this on your thumb. Our finger doesn't make any difference. I put you the head this on you when you're in the hospital. Tired. Exhausted. Yeah. I felt you a while ago, you may still have the temperature. Temperature? Yeah. Okay. 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 When did you leave the hospital? Yesterday? This afternoon. This afternoon? This afternoon? Okay. I try not to involve myself too much with patients because I will get depressed. This time it's going to be a 43-year-old male. Uh, but trying to help them just right then at that point in time, if, if I can help them, it makes me feel good. Get you in, get your uh, half taken out, get your check, okay? He is fine. Yeah, he's, he's, he's fine. Uh -huh. When I finally got him to the hospital, I found out a little bit more about him, and, and they said he shouldn't have ever, never walked out. They were surprised that he was still alive. 
Would you be willing to at least let the doctor see you and talk with you? Not sure what exactly was wrong with him, but uh, he was sick. Depressed. This was more of a domestic situation, but the man is sick and he'll progressively get sick if he doesn't get any care. We were just glad we were able to get him to go to the hospital. Yeah. Just that they got him out of the situation. We don't have to go back over there tonight for a stabbing. Yeah, you know? he's not going to stay. He probably won't take his medications, and we'll see him again. Uh, just some numbers down now. You all right, Major? <laughs> Lifesaver right here. Extra large. All right. Quick. No delay of time. Just shoot. Mega 11 check. Okay, partner. Henry gets a call to a downtown hotel. Mega 11, show us what we sir. Pretty bad. I had uh, went to jail. They drug charge. They they got me in a care home now. Yeah, they have. Are you great? Uh, the conscious. Yeah, we know. Where do you want to go, Drexel? Drexel McClinton claims to be suffering from Tourette's syndrome, but Henry knows that with Drexel, it's never that simple. Drexel McClinton, that name will stay in my mind to the last breath. You call, we haul. He's known throughout the entire city. So I have been out of my medicine for a little while. The main problem is I'm not vomiting in the hotel. He had a spell where basically you would not hear from him for several months, and then all of a sudden you hear from him too much. As a matter of fact, when we don't hear from him, uh, we begin to worry. Is he alive? Yeah, dealing with Tourette's and seizures. Yeah. You know, I stay here in the hotel. He gave me 50% off. You know, good Lord do everything for a reason. You're right. What's the name of the medicine, Drexel, that you uh, taking? Oh. Uh, 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 Kalonidine. Okay. Drexel just basically needs a ride. <laughs> he makes the rounds of emergency rooms. I think he lives with emergency rooms and EMS. Drexel is what paramedics call a frequent flyer. He calls 911 more than he should. Drexel is considered an abuser of the system. We have Mr. Draxel here. It would be great if we had non-emergency units for people like Draxel. Okay. We can send him to triage, actually. Triage. 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 These people seem to know you by name. This is my hospital. This yeah, is my hospital. Baptist Cares. Ah. This gentleman right here has carried Draxel more times than he know him personally. You don't bring Draxel. Yes, yes. That's a three to one kid. Did you bring Draxel? He's, he's one of our yeah. favorite people. Yeah. I've been with all Nashville's paramedics. This is the best one here. Well, thank you. It's the main. Thank you, Mr. Draxel. Hey, if I get a raise, I'll split it with you. <laughs> Take care, Draxel. All right, buddy. See you next round, bud. Uh, he's gone. There he is. See how they do. See the old Southern custom. <laughs> Boy, he's in hell and deep. <laughs> Most people think that we're there to rush somebody to the hospital. That's not necessarily the case. Not everything is the big car accident. Not everything is the big cardiac arrest, and everybody doesn't get saved. I'm learning new things all the time, and it's exciting. It was going to be a pain. Uh, it gets a little bushy and long, and I got to where I was chewing on it, <laughs> and I just didn't want to do that no more. Paramedic Kevin Kennedy is dispatched to a suburban house where someone has pressed their medic alarm. Charlie. Charlie. I'll switch over to command when we get out of 
Kevin Kennedy is on his way to a suburban house where someone has pressed their medic alarm. You'll be turning, like, if you're going towards Ball Road, you'll be turning right onto Clear Lake. 28, Mecca. We got a call, man? We got a call, uh, what they call medical alarm call. Let's see what we got first, because it's a medical alarm. I don't And a lot of times we get there, and there's really not a whole lot to it. But this, this one in particular, we got on the scene, and, uh... We tried to find out just what the deal was, if anybody was home. Hey, I can see somebody laying on a bed inside. Somebody's laying on the bed, okay. Here. Let me see something here. You can, you can just see your feet down there. Oh, yeah. Pretty pale looking. Yeah, it does. We seen an elderly lady lying in bed. And she didn't look too I good. I think so. Let's take this one. Just pop it here. Twitch it. Here we go. Mark and Vic are called to an accident out on the highway. Uh, we arrived on scene. I think it was uh, eastbound 440. That way it runs into 24. Uh, Hi, buddy. Can you tell me your name? Vernon Bodie, B O D E. Vernon Bodie lost control of his car and crashed into the highway median. Well, just stay right where you're at for me, okay? Okay. This gentleman's gonna hold your neck still. You're not hurting anywhere else? When we got on the scene, he was uh, this Oregon. He didn't know where he was, where he was from. Just okay, just hold your head still for me. I'm gonna take a quick look inside the car. Apparently, he'd been living out of his car for several days. Garbage all in the car, food wrappers where he'd eaten fast food. The newspapers from different cities. I think he just lost it and slid into the wall. I don't know how long he'd been traveling. Y'all got that? The gentleman really didn't want to go with us. But he thought he was in Knoxville, we were in Nashville, and he'd repeating himself over and over and over. Do you have a preference on a hospital? Am I in Knoxville? No, sir, you're in Nashville, Tennessee. What the hell am I doing in Nashville? <laughs> sir, I really don't know. You're not having any trouble breathing? No, I'm fine, sir. I'm better. You don't understand why I'm in Nashville. Though. Well, I don't know either. I live in Knoxville, Tennessee. Can you wave your toes for me? Sure. <laughs> Kevin Kennedy's responding to a medic alarm. Oh. You, you set your alarm off. You got any problems? Huh? Hey. What are y'all doing? You turned your alarm. Your alarm's gone off. Have you got any medical problems? We've been trying to get in. Uh, well, I got my doors locked. I know you do. We huh? just, we don't open one of them. Huh? We opened up one of them. What's your name? Hey. Huh. What's your name? Your name? That's what I was afraid of. What? What's your name? Nancy Jones. Nancy? Miss Jones? What is this thing you have here? Uh, what is this thing you have here? What? What, what is this? Uh, well, it's a medical uh, thing. Whatever. Okay, did you push that? No. Do you think maybe you did it maybe by you sleeping when you were sleeping? I wasn't sleeping. I just ready to go to bed. I, I had laid it. Okay. Oh, yeah, on the bed. Okay, well, then it must have been a mistake. Something happened. But I'll tell you what. Down at the fire department, it said that you needed help. Well, they don't. They didn't know whether I needed help or not. Hey, can I check your blood pressure and stuff since we came here? Yeah. Okay, we'll give you, we'll give you an exam. How about that? Huh? We'll examine you. Is that all right? We'll give you an exam. Do what? We'll give you a physical exam. No, I don't want no physical. All right, just your blood pressure. Okay. All right, good. Where'd y'all come from? From the fire station. Oh. Down the street. She was a sweet lady. We uh, checked her vital signs out and we checked her blood pressure and made sure she was okay. Hold your arm straight for her, ma'am, okay? There you go. And uh, she was more concerned about her window at that point in time. How'd you get in? <laughs> we broke the window. <laughs> The city will pay for it, though. Nancy. You better not book one of them windows. Nancy, darling, huh? I'm Officer Lee of the police department. 
I'm gonna make a report for your broken window, okay? So you can get it fixed. He said he'll pay for it. We'll put a new door on if we have to, okay? Who's this guy that's coming? That's her nephew. It's better to uh, assume the worst and find out that it wasn't as bad as what we thought it was than to underscore it and find out that it was something terrible. I'm gonna do a damage to property report. It's what we do as paramedics, in my opinion. I, I, I think we're doing something that's pretty noble. And uh, I don't know if any if I really want to do anything else with my life right now. Imagine that, getting broken every house, break into it, a bunch of people in red shirts standing there staring at you. <laughs> I'd rather keep doing this right up until I can't do it no more. You're pounding on that door. I remember hitting that retaining wall. Well, that's all I remember. That's the last thing you remember? Yeah, did I do a lot of damage to that car? Uh, I didn't get a look at it, but you've done enough. <laughs> Buddy. Lost control of his car. He's retaining wall on both sides. Of the road. I remember getting one side and then the other. In Nashville, but we get a lot of people that are traveling. Uh, is this Rockville or Nashville? You're in Nashville now. They have money, they have means, but they just really have no connections to anybody. I guess in a way we're their family because we're the ones that, when they need help, they don't have anybody else to call. They're going to call the fire department. He still doesn't know where he's coming from or where he's going. He's giving us one address, he's giving them another one. So, when did you spend the night last night? In a motel. In a motel. What about the night before? Motel. What about the night before? I think I was at the last three nights. Okay. Motels. Okay, have you talked to anybody, uh, any member of your family in the past few days? No, sir. Okay. Okay. No, sir. Okay. Well, we're going to scoot. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to scoot out of here and get back to service. I just wanted to see if he's going to be all right. Are you the one who brought me in, sir? Yes, sir. I appreciate it very much. No problem. It's what we're here appreciate, for. Appreciate it very much. I'm yes, sorry. Sir. Sorry I caused you this. You don't need to be sorry. You, I, I just, uh, you need to call some people and let them know where you're well, at. Well, I, I don't have a family, sir. You don't? I have a sister and... Well, that's family. I have a sister in the state of Washington and a daughter I can't even find that lives in New Ellington, South Carolina. Outside of that, that's my family. I don't have a family anymore. They're all dead. The older you get, the more they die. the night shift and Edie Walker needs to stock up on supplies. Take care Miss Edie. Thank you. Y'all be careful. I'm gonna be careless and take plenty of chances. <laughs> See you, Edie. Uh, my car. <laughs> oh, somebody has to do the night shift. It must be us. On calls you never know what you're gonna come about. Every situation that you come across is gonna be different and you learn to appreciate life. You learn to enjoy it as much as possible. Medic 17, 129 7th Avenue South at the Mission. You never know. ETOH. E.D. Walker is dispatched to a heart attack. I never try to feel sorry for myself because there's always somebody else that's, that's got it a whole lot worse than myself. Hey, how y'all doing? How old are you? Forty-two. You have any medical history? Yeah. You have any heart problems? Yeah, he's had three bypasses. Three. David Hooper has a long history of heart disease and alcoholism. Tonight, he thinks he's having a heart attack. I'm gonna get you on my car and get you out here and let you check you out, okay? You could tell that uh, Mr. Hooper was highly intoxicated. I believe I I transported him before. Come on down this way, Dave. It had to be several years that he'd been an alcoholic. Just a chronic abuse. As far as you can go, Dave. You been drinking anything else other than the beer? Uh, no, no. How long has your pain been going on? Uh, no. Hour and a half? It was hard to understand what he was saying because he was so intoxicated. 
On a scale of one to ten, zero means no chest pain at all, and ten means it's so painful that you can't stand it. About where does your chest pain lie? It doesn't lie. Mr. Hooper's blood pressure had bottomed out so low that I couldn't give him any type of medication to help his pain in his heart because everything I had would have dropped it even further. I'm going to give you a little oxygen. That might make you feel a little bit better. The medication that he needed, we didn't carry on the ambulance, so I knew that we had to get him to the hospital as soon as possible. As Edie rushes David Hooper to the hospital, Henry Booker is on his way to an assault. It's not too far from the fire hall. It's about a... About two miles. As a matter of fact, we're coming up on the, on the scene now. It's a female down on the sidewalk. What was that, though? Young mother? She knows him. Uh -huh. He said he thought she had some money. He took a stick to her head. But Netta Lively was beaten over the head by a man who tried to rob her. How long ago did this happen? Just now. And then? We're dealing with a lady that's had a history of mental problems. She's got a head injury from a friend of hers. Uh, I think the main problem besides treating it is going to try to convince her that we're here to help her. She's acting a little bit paranoid at the present time. You want to get on the street? No, I don't want to go nowhere. I thought you wanted to go to general and get that checked into. It's okay. You don't want to? It's okay, ain't it? No, you need to go some stitches in Yeah. You go. Do you know her? Yeah. Come on, honey. Come on. You ready to go? You ready to go? Okay. Just Come on, go on. We'll get you away from these people. Come on. Get you out of this crowd, okay? You're gonna take care of you. Let me help you, huh? There you go. Do you have a seat back there for me? What's going on? We're trying to get your head. You got a bad cut right there. No, I don't. Yeah, look at all the blood. Look at all the blood you lost. See, we're gonna get you some help. My name is Henry. You're sorry, woman? Don't cry. You need to learn to start eating. Not drink so much, okay? David Hooper's history of heart disease and neglect may have finally caught up with him. Hang on just a minute, woman. Substantial chest pain for about an hour and a half. Non-compliant with any of his meds for about two or three days. Highly ETOH. Cardiac history, three bypasses, no heart attack that I can tell right now. His color wasn't good. You know, you said he had severe chest pain, and he had gotten into position that night where his blood pressure would, had bottomed back out again because his heart just wasn't pumping like it should. Got two of the blood hanging. No allergies. What you need, Dave? Your ex-girlfriend. Is that what you've been? Is that what you've been talking about? Spitting image. Is that right? Yeah. You actually keep seeing the people that you pick up time after time. There we go. Don't that work? That works a lot better, doesn't it? And eventually they'll start slipping through the system. Ninety-five over sixty. Down some. You see them slowly dwindling. See their health slowly failing. I'm gonna sit here with you till somebody goes back, okay? All right. You're welcome. We'll go over there one day, I'm sure, and it'll probably be soon. And uh, we'll end up having a code, Mr. Hooper, because he never takes his meds. When I leave at the end of a shift, I try to leave it here. I try not to take it home. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Sometimes it takes quite a while to shake it. So you gonna be okay? Oh, yeah. I'll be fine. How's that gonna be? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm gonna be Yeah, fine. you're gonna be fine. We've seen a lot worse. Have you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but we're just concerned about the blood you lost there on your shirt and out of your head there. Oh, that ain't tight. Yeah, yeah. It's got blood. it on your face. We'll get you there. Oh, I got blood on my face, yeah. man? Where it's dried up. We're going to wash it. Oh, up. no, man. Yeah. We're going to get it washed. Ain't no blood on my face. It's a lot of it. Oh. I just, I've been at Fred, but my head hurt real bad it's, right now. That's a good reason to come in here and let him look at it. You ready? I'll be right with you. You ready, huh? Man, 
Here we go. Ready? Come on, let me help you. It's gonna be fine. Everything's okay. Nobody's around. It wasn't like it was over there. Everybody looking at you. There we go. It's fine. I'll be right with you. Don't forget my name now. It's Henry. If you need anything, it's hostile. You gonna go with me? Oh, yeah. I'll be right with you. Yeah. Okay, I'm right here with you. You don't have to worry about it. Just have a seat right there. Right here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're doing fine. There you go. Okay, you turn around. Put your legs up. There you go. I'm glad it wasn't a serious call. I think if she get her medicine back in her system, she'd be a lot better. I think that's a bigger problem than the cut. Uh, what you come <laughs> from? Let me see a second. You do what? Alright, open the load. Uh, uh, open the load. Pull me towards you. Pull me towards you. Oh, okay, not so far. Okay, push me away. Get away, get away. Use my hands and towards your side. Okay. I ain't done. No problem. Okay. Just a little Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, thank and you. I give you an A for uh, nurse of the year. Oh, yeah. Right. Talk to the Commodore. Yeah, yeah she knew right. It's Commodore. As Henry leaves the hospital, he bumps into an old friend. We meet again, like yeah. God, do everything for us. For a reason. Yeah, you're right, partner. We're still running calls, I tell you, ever since we left you. Take care, Dracula. Wait till I tell the nurse who's coming to see her. I went outside to put the stretch in the unit. Uh -huh. Drexel was being registered. No, yeah. No, he left the no, They don't no. have a psychiatric pool. No, we're here. <laughs> oh, boy. Drexel's like a bad penny. Every time you turn around, you're seeing I was just putting a stretch in the ambulance, and all of a sudden, they come walking by when I dropped him off about two miles down the road at another hospital. So, <laughs> Drexel, that name was burned in my mind for another. I'll probably leave, leave this earth saying Drexel. So. We'll wake up in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
21st century begins, the modern firefighter is faced with numerous challenges, including natural disasters, emergency medical calls, and urban terrorism. The heart of the fire service, however, remains the job of extinguishing fires and saving lives, and the key to accomplishing that task is still the fire hose. Technology continues to make the job of firefighting safer and more efficient, but being well practiced in hose handling and nozzle skills remains essential to saving life and property. Selecting the correct hose and nozzle for each fire situation increases the effectiveness of an engine company's fire attack. Performing that function effectively also helps build a positive image with the community with the perception that their fire department is a highly skilled, competent organization. Fire hose and nozzles have evolved tremendously over the years. Today's hose and nozzles are much lighter. Large diameter hose moves much larger volumes of water than ever before. Modern hose is also virtually leak-proof and more resistant to bursting from pump pressures. But even the latest technology and improvements are meaningless without constant practice to maintain proficiency with fire attack lines. FETN now takes you to the scenic New England community of Manchester, New Hampshire, where area firefighters are going to give a hands-on demonstration of operating fire attack lines and getting the maximum benefit from nozzle operations. We'll also talk with frontline firefighters about their real-life experiences they've had in the heat of battle. Firefighters never know when they might be faced with a similar situation. Welcome back to FEC. And back to the basics. I'm your host, Gary Simpson, with the Manchester, New Hampshire Fire Department. In part two of this series, we'll look at fire streams and advancing hose lines. We'll also take a look at the proper advancement of handheld hose lines and the attack on the fire, and also the proper nozzle pattern for the right fire that may be encountered. Let's just talk a little bit about hose lines here. When firefighters arrive on the scene, it's their responsibility to size up the scene decide what size hose line would be appropriate to make the fire attack. In some cases, an inch and three quarter line with a backup inch and three quarter would be the hose line of choice. In other situations, it may be better for the firefighter to go right to a two and a half and go with a bigger line for fire attack. Here we see one firefighter on an inch and three quarter line. Many times the firefighter needs to advance the line on a fast-moving fire. The firefighter merely leans forward to counteract the force of the nozzle and walks in a forward direction. This same method can also be used with two firefighters on the line. Normally, using a two and a half inch attack line, a minimum of two firefighters and preferably three firefighters should be used to operate this line. However, here, one firefighter finds it necessary to operate this two and a half inch line by himself. A reasonably safe way to accomplish this is the firefighter make about a 20 foot loop in the hose and placing the nozzle back under the two and a half inch line. The firefighter then sits on the hose where it crosses and request the line to be charged. This two-man crew has been asked to reposition their line. The nozzle person merely shuts down the shutoff valve for the nozzle. The nozzle person gives the word to reposition the line a new location. Once in the new location, the nozzle person slowly opens the shutoff valve so as not to cause damage to themselves, the hose, or the pump. Note, these firefighters are using hose straps to 
could better control their line, causing less firefighter fatigue. firefighters operating a two and a half inch line have been asked to relocate. The safest way of accomplishing this task would be for the nozzle person to slowly close the shutoff valve, for the firefighters to reposition the line to where it's needed, and then slowly open the nozzle again. Yeah, well, I found through my years of experience to, of pulling the right size line for the uh, right amount of fire that you have. Uh, the amount of fire that you have dictates, should dictate the size of line that you're pulling. I find that uh, people in the uh, fire service now are pulling inch and three quarter lines when the fire is actually dictating that they should be pulling two and a half lines. And the, I found that the inch and three quarter line has become the booster line of the 90s in the fire service. I've had a few experiences where we were pulled up where we've had heavy involvement of fire on multiple floors of buildings and the firefighters are stretching inch and three quarter lines to protect exposures and to do interior fire attack when they actually should be pulling two and a half inch lines. It's imperative that the firefighter pick the right nozzle for the job, whether it be a fog nozzle, a solid bore nozzle, a fixed gallonage or a variable gallonage nozzle, every nozzle has a place in the fire service. Picking the right nozzle can make the difference between having a successful fire attack or doing additional damage during firefighting operations. This nozzle is an Elkhart SM20 automatic with pistol grip, also known as a constant pressure nozzle. Constant pressure nozzles automatically vary the flow to maintain an effective nozzle pressure. With this type of nozzle, the nozzle person can change the rate of flow by opening or closing shutoff valves. This nozzle can also be used in the straight stream pattern for reach, fog, or semi-fog positions. I love Kellogg's Frosted Flakes. Do that in the 70s, you know, when I worked for the funeral home ambulance service, we'd sometimes, you know, the driver would run red lights and siren because we could charge $35 for Miss Maud rather than $30. And she thought we were a company man when, when we did that. And that was appreciated. But, but, um, but there's just no, uh, there's just no, uh, uh, legitimate reason to do that in this day and time and to I mean, the the uh, the political and legal bureaucracy in Chicago acknowledges the the obvious risk to doing that too because I I produced for them a 12 page single space typewritten document of my observations uh, of the Chicago system of which that was uh, uh, one of the more blatant and major concerns uh, but yet in the final consultant's report that was released uh, to the mayor's office, there was no mention of that. Uh, the city attorneys and the mayor thought that that was, that was so egregiously in error uh, that it would just, it would provide such unlimited fodder to, to local attorneys that it was just too much of a risk to put into print. And uh, so it didn't appear. So I'll be, uh, I'll be meeting with my uh, distinguished medical director friends from Chicago in January, and I'll ask them if they're still running red lights and siren to the hospital with everybody. <clears throat> okay. Now, uh, is ambulance transport time with lights and siren faster than without? Now, this is the, f the, uh, the now famous 1995 study published in the Annals of Emergency Medicine uh, where they documented a 43-second time savings using red lights and siren. 
But that was one system. You know, we saw this other system. It was a little bit longer, three minutes, 50 seconds with longer transport intervals. Uh, and there was another study. Uh, anybody recognize that rig? <clears throat> uh, out of hospital provider beliefs regarding use of red lights and siren. Now, this is a group that polled actual EMS practitioners as to what they thought how much time const uh, constituted a significant savings. 15% uh, of people thought if you could save less than a minute, then that was worthwhile. 27% uh, thought, well, you know, if you can save a minute or two, 16% uh, two to three minutes. 14% of people said, well, if it's not at least three minutes, then, then I wouldn't consider it significant. So there's some, some variability there. I, I, don't know, I don't know what the right or wrong answer is, um, but I think, I think it, 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 it has to do probably more with, with what needs to be done in an emergency department in that time interval, whatever it is, that we can't do in the ambulance. And, you know, when you think about it in that way, there's really, you know, maybe not a whole lot thrombolytics for uh, uh, acute MIs or, or now perhaps for strokes uh, or, you know, if there are intubation issues or, uh, you know, people in status epilepticus, that sort of thing. There's some, there's some legitimate things. Uh, and in that same uh, uh, article, 20% of people thought that operating red lights and siren had no effect on the incidence of collisions. Um, and uh, that's, I thought, was, was interesting. <clears throat> and of these opinions, it didn't have anything to do with their level of training, you know, EMT versus paramedic. didn't have anything to do with their years of experience, and, nor did it have anything to do with whether or not they'd had a driver safety course or not. So I thought that was just kind of interesting. Now, this, this next article is, uh, uh, has to do with uh, EMS education uh, or education of EMS type uh, things in medical students. And I include this because it was done at Vanderbilt by Judy Jean Chapman and, and, uh, and her students. And it has to do with the impact, impact of EMS education on uh, uh, emergency medicine ability and career choices of medical students. And they used a pre-test, post-test format, and they had 190 students that completed uh, the survey at both, both ends, before and after. Uh, just some background information as to who these people are. 44% of them had some family member in an uh, in EMS profession, or in a, in a medical profession, uh, physician, nurse, paramedic, whatever. 3% um, were either EMTs or paramedics themselves. And 35% had some experience in an emergency department as an employee, a volunteer, an aide, something like that. Now, on the front end, 20% expressed some interest in, the, in emergency medicine. At the end of the course, that went up to 30%, uh, 15, uh, 50% higher. Uh, they asked if, you know, how they felt uh, about uh, approaching a patient that was acutely ill or acutely injured. Uh, 21 of the 190 thought that you know, produced significant anxiety, uh, and that went down from 21 of the 190 to 13 of the 190. Uh, those that, when confronted with an acutely ill or injured patient, found that exciting, you know, an adrenaline rush, we're, you know, that's, I mean, that's why, you, that's why we do this, we're adrenaline junkies. That number went up from 152 to 175 of the 190. <clears throat> And, you know, they also received instructions in ha handling uh, uh, an obstructed airway and CPR. And uh, if faced with such a scenario, uh, the number of, or the percent of those that thought they would feel comfortable in that setting went up most dramatically from 20% to, uh, to 55%. But, uh, but still you can, can uh, I mean, it, it's, this, it's still only 55%, so you can still uh, sense that they're not, uh, not uh, horribly self-confident yet. Which, uh, which may be actually be a healthy thing. <clears throat> okay, all right. Now, a little bit about standing orders. Now, uh, you know, our trend has been toward increasing use of standing orders, uh, and that seems to be a logical thing. Uh, there's not been any dissent among the ranks here in this town about that. Uh, uh, in fact, the, uh, the, the complaints have been, you know, why we've been waiting so long. Well, you think we've been waiting a long time? Uh, this article uh, published a year ago at the ASEP Research Forum 
talked about implementation of standing field treatment protocols in Los Angeles. <clears throat> now this is uh, the Los Angeles City Fire Department as opposed to LA County. Uh, the paramedics in, in LA City transport, they staff the ambulances. In LA County, it's Gage and DeSoto and the red trucks, they don't transport. <clears throat> but we're talking about the, the City Fire Department. Uh, 250,000 calls annually, so they're busy folk. And they developed, uh, implemented standing orders for seven medical chief complaints and uh, major trauma incidents. And the study was uh, done during the first 21 days of implementation of these standing orders. And during those three weeks, they had uh, 13 and a half thousand EMS calls. 30% uh, of those were ALS. Uh, oh, by the way, one, you know, they're a little, they've been a little slow in, in implementing standing orders in, in LA, uh, but they, they implemented the medical party dispatch system ahead of us, and for the, the whole first year that they sent ambulances to, to specific, you know, specifically screen calls without using red lights and siren uh, for those few cases, they didn't get a single complaint about a slow response interval. So it's like, you know, the public kind of understands what's appropriate too. So anyway, but back to this issue. Uh, 4,000 of those calls, or 30%, were thought to be potentially ALS, and on about half of those, they used, they implemented these standing orders. 54% of the ALS calls, uh, and so the standing orders were used on 16% of all the calls uh, in that three-week period. Uh, two of the most commonly uh, uh, implemented, altered level of consciousness, 29%, uh, chest pain, 25%. <clears throat> Now, in, in review, they looked at those 21,077 calls, and they identified three that did not receive the appropriate treatment. But on none of those three was there any effect on patient care. Most of the errors that were identified through the CQI process had to do with poor documentation uh, rather than, than poor patient care. <laughs> so it was a very smooth implementation of these protocols. Now, I just kind of ran some numbers. Uh, 2,177 calls, and you know, I was just thinking about how much physician time, you know, the three weeks before they implemented this, would that have involved to, to, to process these calls? Uh, figure, you know, a physician's doing something, gets interrupted, called to the radio, hears the report, has some interaction, issues some orders, goes back to what they were doing before, has to, you know, kind of regroup your thoughts, you know, and pick up from where you were. I figure that would take about three minutes. Maybe sometimes a little longer, maybe sometimes a little less, but three minutes. Well, you'd, you'd multiply 2177 times three, 6,531 minutes, 109 hours. That's four and a half 24 hours a day, 24 hour days of physicians just being on the radio with paramedics. That's 11 10 hour shifts. So, so my question is, is, what took them so long? I mean, these are, these are physicians now that aren't being interrupted and aren't uh, um, delaying care of the patients that they're seeing in the emergency departments. And as we've talked before, you know, when you go from, from uh, direct medical control to standing orders, the, care, the patient care happens faster, happens more uniformly, and the, the pre-hospital interval is shorter. Okay. Uh, so, so with respect to standing orders, we've been on the right track, and, I'm, and I think we're very comfortable with that. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, a couple of articles on interaction of, of us, you know, EMS practitioners with emergency department personnel that I thought were, were, were interesting. <clears throat> and uh, they did this first one. Uh, Actually, they're both done by the University of Connecticut, probably along the, the same time course. Uh, this is from the EMS pro provider's perspective. Uh, this is how, how do the emergency departments function uh, in interacting, interacting with you. They uh, uh, queried 600 people, got 112 responses, <clears throat> and they addressed the, the questions addressed three major areas, radio uh, communications, uh, interactions uh, with the emergency department staff, and, and equipment and supplies. You know, how much, you know, is it secure? Do they lose it? Is it stolen? And, you know, stuff like that. Uh, the EMS uh, personnel identified in six areas uh, as opportunities for improvement. 
you know, those things we used to call screw-ups. Opportunities for improvement. They uh, had, with, had to do with respect to a physician availability for radio consultation. Well, as, you, as the system develops more standing orders, that problem solves itself. Uh, physician willingness to approve medication orders. We've had some experience with that in our own community. Uh, although I don't hear those complaints as much, certainly not near as much as we did five years ago. Um, and uh, physician awareness of EMS controls. It was not exactly clear what they meant by the term controls, but I, I, I surmise it had to do with, with the physician awareness of protocols, procedures, uh, and that sort of thing. And I think, uh, I think as, as the years have gone by in, in our own community, we're having a combination of, of, of both uh, physician, uh, practicing emergency physician, uh, increased awareness of, of uh, the, the competence and, and capabilities and protocols uh, under which we operate. Uh, plus, we're, we're, as the years have gone by, we've gotten a more sophisticated emergency medicine physician uh, population who, who've been trained with EMS personnel and understand EMS and are, are far more accepting of our, uh, uh, of our role because they understand uh, what it is and what it can do. Uh, they had some problems with the attitudes and attentiveness of uh, triage nurses upon arrival and just the availability of, of a nurse uh, to give the patient report to. And again, as I mentioned, the security of EMS equipment left in the emergency department. And that doesn't seem to be the, the problem that we once had. You know, we used to see, you know, out-of-town ambulance services all the time coming in with, uh, you know, we had the, the, the old Metro decal that was on the wooden spine boards. We'd, when I, at Vandy, we'd, we'd see spine boards come in that had been freshly painted, but you could see the outline of the decal underneath the paint. That, that doesn't seem to be as much of a problem anymore. <clears throat> now, they also allowed the emergency department staff to evaluate EMS provider uh, performance. Uh, and they looked at, uh, oh, these are the people that they talked with, nurses, uh, emergency medicine resident physicians who may or, or may not understand, you know, what actually goes on in the field, and, uh, and attending emergency physicians. And they primarily discussed two areas of, uh, of, of uh, issue, radio communications and then uh, emergency department interaction uh, with respect to patient care. Uh, they were very happy with accurate and pertinent verbal reports and, and that those reports were presented in a very professional manner. And, and I think that, uh, uh, that our experience here is similar. They weren't quite as, as satisfied with the level of organization and efficiency of radio reports. Uh, and, and some of that has to do with, um, and they may be differenti dif differentiating bedside reports from radio reports, uh, because, because it's much more of a, of a challenge to develop a, uh, a verbal image of your patient uh, when, you know, at, at the base station, you're not seeing the patient. And, and all you know is, is are the words that are communicated. <clears throat> and uh, appropriateness of uh, requests for medications, uh, proper patient history and medication lists. Uh, that's not often a, a, um, a, a significant uh, issue. With respect to the latter, one of the, one of the changes that you may see uh, experienced uh, is uh, one of the um, they don't call them pre-arrival instructions because those are, you know, help the patient uh, uh, instructions, but they call them post-dispatch instructions, which are kind of generic and applicable to almost any environment. And the, the, the dispatchers will tell the, the, the caller to, to gather the patient's medicines together so they'll be ready for you when you get there. Uh, and things like just, you know, put the dog away, uh, turn on the front porch light, things like that that will be helpful to you. That, uh, that you may not even know that they're doing. <clears throat> uh, another area of concern was, was uh, the personnel not being available in the emergency department for questions. And some of that's just the nature of the beast. I mean, you know, you, you give, you know, bedside report to the patient, the patient's now, you know, from your cot to their cot. Uh, you gotta get your cot ready to go again, uh, which means, you know, you gotta take it back to the ambulance. Uh, the ambulance may be in uh, uh, varying states of disarray, and, and so there are obligations that, that you've got to meet there. Uh, so, so some of that's just going to happen. But, uh, I, you know, a, just a finesse point 
you know, as, as, as you're leaving, before you leave, if the physician is out and about, uh, if they're at the, the desk and notice the station, or at, this, at your patient's bedside, you might just ask if there are any questions before you go. Uh, you know, I wouldn't, inter if they're in a room with somebody else, I wouldn't interrupt them necessarily, but, uh, but uh, that just may let them know that you're aware um, and may prompt them to, to ask a question that they hadn't consciously thought of, but just a, a you know, matter of professional uh, courtesy and just, just polishing the craft. Uh, ability to recognize and identify, identify major disease processes. <clears throat> Some of that just comes with experience and, and, um, and seeing sick patients and, and seeing how they, how they present. Uh, you know, vital signs are called vital signs because they're vital, you know, pay attention to them. If people are, are breathing faster than normal or working a little bit harder to breathe, that's a sign that something's going on. It may not be obvious to you what it is, and sometimes we may jump to, uh, uh, to conclusions a little bit too swiftly uh, you know, some, somebody that looks like a, a lunger uh, may just have an exacerbation of COPD, and that may be all it is. I mean, they may have a pneumonia, they may have a spontaneous pneumothorax, they may be septic, they may have a pulmonary embolus. Uh, and, and one of our great challenges is to try to, to not, you know, not hang a, hang a hook on a, on, a, on a diagnosis prematurely because uh, it, can, it can bite you in the, in the, where you don't want to be bit. <clears throat> 